Hey, uh, you know, well, you know, this is Dark Lord Cthulhu, but, uh, lately I know I've been, uh, kind of not doing videos. Uh, I've been really busy with school, and I'm, I'm still pretty far behind trying to catch up with some of the work I've missed. Just, you know, I have no excuse. It was mostly out of laziness, but <laughs> that's not the point. Point being, uh, I haven't done a video on D&D in a while, so today I'm going to do one. Um... Today I'm going to talk a bit about formulating a good story for your dungeons, as well as uh, incorporating a uh, incorporating it into the gameplay. You know, for example, instead of you just walking through a uh, animated story, make it feel like something's at stake. Well, first most important thing is you have to have a basic plot line. It could be you could have an idea for what you want to do over the whole course of the dungeon dungeon, I'm sorry, the whole course of the campaign, you could have an overarching goal or something like that, or you could do it episodically, like do each particular dungeon as a, its own self-contained story, just with the same characters. It's kind of like the difference between a show like uh, Walking Dead and a show like, for example, The Simpsons. I know they're completely different, but it makes the point well. The Simpsons... I'm sorry. Everything that happens in The Simpsons is in that one episode. It could be like it never happened. Bart has had countless birthdays. They've had 20-something Christmases, and yet they're all the same age. But when you look at a show like uh, Walking Dead or Fringe or something that's got a long-running story, the characters change. The things that happen actually matter. And this could be a difference in D&D. Like, you could have... <laughs> sorry, the TV said diarrhea. I got distracted. But you could have a... Uh, like each episode, a character could get killed, and then you could randomly bring him back. That is, you know, it's not that serious, but you can do a storyline that matters. Like if you've ever played Mass Effect, everything you do in that game matters. If you play Dragon Age, it's mostly Bioware that does a lot of these uh, things where your choices matter. But these games where your choices matter. But I think that's a good touch because it makes it, the story feel more real. And if you fail at something, you can know that it could take this whole world that's been put together and just ruin it. Like right now in my dungeon, we're after the man in the red robes. I just did three air quotes. That That's not right. That's not grammatically correct. Anyway, um... <sighs> the man in the red robes. Uh, he had a symbol on him, and they're trying to figure out what the symbol means. Now, everybody in my dun in my campaign... I have a friend who calls the campaign a dungeon, and it really got on my nerves for a while, but then I started to ignore it, and now I'm in the habit of saying that, and I'm trying to kick that habit, but... Over, whole story, the whole game, everything that happens as a whole is the campaign. Each particular game is the dungeon or adventure. Some people just call them all dungeons, but I like adventure better because not everything happens in this subterranean prison. But anyway, regardless, uh, right now they're looking for that guy, and if this guy is allowed to keep doing what he's going to do, the whole universe is going to disappear. Like, the whole material plane will shake apart. So it sort of adds a sense of urgency, and uh, they've got this one mystery going on with that symbol. They're trying to find out what it means and who this guy is. Whereas, if I had played a less serious one where you know everyone just wants to mess around, uh, they, there wouldn't be all these little mysteries and story hooks. And that's important if you want to make a decent story. You have to have hooks and mysteries, like something that you have to have things you don't tell them and make them keep wanting to know what's going on and keep them in the dark about things. It's how a good story is told. But uh, on to gameplay mechanics. If you've ever played a video game, if you haven't played a video game before, then you're either underprivileged or you don't like video games. And I mean, I guess that's okay as long as because you, you're watching my videos, which means you have some taste in gaming. But not the point. Every video game I've ever played has, to some extent, had this particular formula to each level, place, mission, whatever it happens to be. Enemies, enemies, puzzle optional. There's not always a puzzle. Enemies, enemies, mini boss, enemies, boss. It doesn't have to be that long, but that's actually cliched, but it's a great formula for the dungeon that you might happen to be running. It's a very good formula. And, and like with the boss, you feel like in the end, you know, you fought your way through. And if there's a lot of encounters, you first of all, if you're going to have a lot of encounters, you better have the story to match it up. Story is more important. So if you're only going to have a few encounters, fill it with plenty of like events and stories and a lot of vivid description but um 
with, with a lot of encounters, in the end, they feel like they fought a big battle. Now, with a few encounters and a really good mood, they feel like they've done a real part of the story. And it's important to balance these things. If there's not enough encounters, it's not going to be a game. And if there's not enough story, it's just going to be a game. And that's the thing. D&D isn't just a game. It's a story. I'm going to mute my TV. I apologize. I do these all in one take because uh, I do have editing software, but... For some reason, when I edit it, it lowers... Maybe someone can help me out with that. It lowers the quality down, and it looks like crap on YouTube. Whereas, if I just do it in one take with this video, I could do it in 720p. If anybody knows any good free editing software, go ahead and comment it. But, completely unrelated. Um, I'm sure you can see in the background there. Yeah, there is my player's guide. I do take good care of it, but right now it's just sitting on the stairs. And another thing is, when you play, you don't want to put every single hook into each into the dungeon. Like, if you put every hook and every story and everything right into one dungeon, you're going to run out of ideas. you got to make sure that you spread it out, unless you've got a lot of ideas. Like, I've always been known to bring new life into a dying dungeon, but a dying campaign. But um, when you want to do that, when you, when you put everything into one dungeon and you don't save anything, the campaign's going to get really, really repetitive and boring by the end. And uh, that's another thing, short versus long. Sometimes shorter is better to tell a good story unless you have, like again, a lot of events and ideas. Because to play D&D, to do a campaign, you have to know how to tell a really long story and keep it interesting and keep, keep everything going. Like, I got... The highest I actually ever got was to level 18. And after that, we just, it got bad, but, I mean, we got epic, we went epic, we went to maybe level 35, but after 18, it wasn't the same anymore. I mean, by the time we were at 35, we were slaying gods, and at that point, it's just, you know, everything's too big, and it's not fun anymore, because there's no, it's all power gaming. And another thing, again, that destroys the story is a power gamer. Uh, again, some people just like to say, oh, I want to attack that, I want to attack this, I want to attack that, I want to loot this guy when I'm in the middle of a battle. All they want is personal glory, and you got to kick those people out or get them to play the game right. Because it's an adult game, it's not all about when is it my turn, when is it my turn, when is it my turn. Uh, you know, that's how a little kid plays sorry. Is it my turn yet? Is it my turn yet? Is it my turn yet? And, you know, after a while you hit them, you know, lightly just to give them a warning, but, you know, everything goes fuzzy, and the next thing you know, you're in jail for a few nights because... You didn't just hear that. Shut up. Anyway, um, you got to find... And another thing that uh, when it comes to uh, keeping the storyline interesting is, um, on the previous subject, interesting characters. You have to find people... Because, you know, it's a team effort. Everyone has fun with it. But you got to make sure that you're sort of on the same page. Because if your friends want to make all these silly, super... Like, characters that are silly and over-the-top dramatic... Or... Uh, over the top or versus like dramatic and dark if you want to make a dramatic and dark dungeon you need to find people who can play characters like that if you want to make a fun dungeon that's like a lot of yeah rush into battle two arms blah 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 then you have you want people who are more better at making over the top characters I'm pretty sure more better is not grammatically correct but that's not the point point. and uh, the best thing to do really is to just work with the characters. Sometimes you're going to have to work with characters that don't exactly fit into your dungeon and just make things a little more, you know, fitting with them. Like, I had this really, really good dungeon campaign. I'm going to kill well named Deleted. I don't want to say his name on YouTube for fear of him getting upset, but um, when it comes to characters like that, you just have to try and mold the world around them. And I had molded this world that's like really dark, war-torn, just a mess. And the, every all my characters, all the PCs decided to make characters who were funny and jokey and not serious. And it really just took the whole dungeon. And, you know, it's one thing, again, those characters fit into certain kinds of dungeons. But if you try to put... If you try to put a square peg into a round hole, either the round hole is going to be horribly misshapen in the end, or the peg is just going to be misshapen in the end or it just won't work and actually what kind what kind of happened with me was the uh, I'm gonna say it, the hole was misshapen shut up and the the world was just ruined now again it can the world can ruin a character but that could work like the character could change 
and become much less unfitting of this world. But you need to talk to your PCs ahead of time. PCs is player characters, by the way. I don't know who knows that, who doesn't know that. When you talk to them, just sit them down and say, before the dungeon, before the campaign, i kill you, say, hey, this one is very serious, slightly on the darker side, or, you know, this is over the top, just have as much fun as you want. But make sure they know what they're getting into, because if you have to kick someone out of a game, believe me, it's not easy. Because, excuse me, a lot of people don't like to be kicked out of games. Like, if you I hate this game, but people who play Call of Duty, when they get kicked, they go into a rage. I mean, I used to play, I'll admit it. I used to play Call of Duty 4, and, uh... I don't even know. Was it Call of Duty 4? I don't remember what game it was, to be honest. It was some game I was playing on Xbox a while ago. It was a shooter. It was a game where you could kick people. I don't remember if you could do that in Call of Duty 4 or not, but he kicked him, and he sent everybody just these ravingly stupid, stupid, mind you, but really angry messages. I mean, if you're really bad at something, you shouldn't be among people who are good at it. You should work your way up, but that's not the point. I don't play Call of Duty anymore, so don't bother asking. I hate it now because it's been the same game since Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. I mean, World at War, they made some changes. Well, World at War was basically the same as Call of Duty 4 gameplay-wise. Modern Warfare 2 and onwards were just all the same. All the same game in different settings. And if somebody if somebody comments, no, they have different guns, I'm going to find you and I'm going to do bad things. Because that doesn't matter. But I'm really getting off subject here. I'll do... I'll, I'll do a rant another time, but uh, people don't like being kicked out of games. They don't. And when you do kick them out of a game, they tend to rave and go mad. And this isn't over the internet. This is in real life. I have personally seen people go nuts and start throwing things. And the first thing they usually throw is whatever they can get their hands on, which is usually dice. If it's their dice, great, because once they leave, you can, find, you can get some new dice because they're not coming back for them, you know, out of pride. But if they're your dice, you're going to be looking for them. And that both of those are true stories. I had one person throw my dice all over the room, and I lost most of them. And I had another person throw his dice all over the room, and I, I gained some back. Actually, I think that I think they were both the same guy. But um, you really need to know how to kick someone out pleasantly. So there's no way you're going to be able to sneak around and play because this game, you can't sneak around playing it. People are going to know what you're doing right away when they see the dice in the books. So you you could try to avoid the people who you don't want to play, but Sometimes you just got to be firm and say, we're done. You're done. Get out. And I've had to do that before, and it's, it's not easy. Because you, if, if you have any kind of uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If you're any kind of a good person, you'll feel bad about it afterwards. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. But uh, back on the subject of expanding the story, another thing you really want to do is find ways to tell everybody about the universe. Like before you start your first your first your first dungeon, I almost said campaign there, um, tell everybody about the world. And I'm going to give you a list of things that are important to fleshing out the world. Politics, like the way the world is run, what's going on, like how relations are between races, what's the common language, what's running around, well, nature, what's running around in the wild, who lives out in the wild, who lives in the cities, um, gods and, and religion, what's the most common religions, um, stuff like that. Race relations. How do elves get along with humans? How do dwarves get along with elves? Just build it as much as possible. Five, this might not be important because you might not include it, but planes. And I don't mean airplanes. I mean, well, there is a plane of air, but that's elemental planes. We'll talk about that another time. Other dimensions of reality. Like in mine, we have the material plane, which is connected to the plane of the dead, which is which are connected through the astral plane. The astral plane is like a hallway in between the two, if you can think of it that way. This is my world. This isn't in the books. This is my thing. Um, and then on these worlds, we have two other planes that are connected. One is the Feywild, which is the source of all magic. And one is... Actually, I don't have a name for it yet. If anybody could think of something good, that'd be nice. But I just call it the Dead Zone. It's just a place that's pure material and pure... That's all. That's all that's there is material. And in this universe, the way life was created was that the material and the magic fused. And everything just sort of came together. Now, in the plane of... In the dead plane, there's some magic. And in the Feywild, there's just enough material to make it a material plane. But 
they sort of come together in our world to create what we have here. You know, life and a bit of magical powers, that sort of thing. So if you were to go to the Feywild, you couldn't stay there very long. You'd be ripped apart by, by magic. Or if you were strong enough, you'd get very, very strong with magic. If you went to the material plane for long enough, your energy would entropize. Um, I don't know if that's an actual word. I sort of made it up. Entropy is the... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The continuing breakdown of energy. I don't know if it's breakdown. Uh, how do I put this? It's energy becoming more and more disorganized. And matter is energy. So basically you go there and the magic that keeps you, that makes you alive sort of comes apart. So your body just becomes whatever, stone. Yeah, something like that. It becomes material and no life is in it. And you you just disappear. So that's not a place any living creature wants to spend very long in. Now, the what happened in the war that preceded the beginning of my story was that the two sides, Tiamat and Bahamut, got the gods taking sides, and humans as well, and elves and all that. The world was at war, the gods were at war, it was huge, and it almost destroyed the entire wheel, as we call it, the cosmic wheel, which is all the... That's, I, think that's, I think that was actually in the D&D book, it's just all the planes. So, one great god stepped forth, um, I haven't named him yet, and said, okay, Tiamat, you're going to get one of the layers, you're going to get the bottom 22 layers of the abyss. I just made up a number. There are 666 layers to the abyss, it's the home of the demons. Bator has nine layers, it's more like Dante, like Dante's Inferno, but demons and devils are at war, that remain constant in my universe. And Tiamat, no, Tiamat got the bottom 22 layers, she's the evil one. Bahamut got one of the spheres of paradise. I'm not sure if that was in the D&D book either, or if I'm actually just quoting Dante's Inferno. But he got one of those, and everybody was happy for a while. But acts such as necromancy and anything that changed anything in the material or the material plane of the Feywild was banned. Few spells were allowed left, like the simple ones. Fireball, create water, things like that. But this guy in the red suit was bringing the dead back to life, which is bad, because he's risking tearing the whole universe apart. Now, you can be honest with me, if that really pulled you into my universe, I, I explained it a lot better when we were playing, of course, but if that really pulled you into my universe, just let me know um, if you like that story. If not, be honest, what can I fix about it? You know, I'm always open to suggestion and constructive criticism. The key word is constructive. It's not constructive to say, just give up, nobody likes you and no one ever will. But it's constructive to say, okay, you can take such and such an idea and expand upon it, you know? And I'm always open to people giving me suggestions. But uh, moving on, you really have to do that. You have to get all those elements in at the very beginning so people know what's going on. And if you have good players, they'll remember. And sometimes, I mean, I've had my players remember things that I'd forgotten I said. I'm like, oh, impressive. But I've had other players who, for example, the elves, this is a different campaign, the elves and dwarves were at war. And he was a dwarf, and he went into an elven compound and just started drinking and got into a bar fight. So he got arrested and sentenced to death, so everybody had to sort of escape this elven stronghold. Really stupid decision, but, you know, he was a good player, you know. He played it well. And it was just more, uh, what do you call it? What's the word? It was more tension for the story. But, um, what else can you add to a good story? Again, uh... You could pre-make characters. Some people don't mind playing pre-made characters, but I don't always suggest that because characters, you know, the PCs need to have their own uh, creativity too and their own creative input. But if you can find people who are willing to play pre-made characters, the story will be a lot better if they're if they're good at what they do. Um, but if you you know if you have good PCs, let them make their own characters. What's the problem? Uh, as long as they know the universe and keep that and bear that in mind. And um, I think that's about it. Again, remember, politics, race relations between elves, dwarves, humans, and whatever else you have in your universe, cosmic stuff, gods, deities, and language barriers are good too. Like, if you include a language barrier, like, if a dwarf tries to speak to some elves who don't speak common, where they're just like, I don't speak elven, obviously, but I hear it sounds like French. Spaghetti. I don't know. And that's that's that also immerses you a little more because it makes it more realistic and believable. But uh, I think that's about all I wanted to say on that subject. Thanks for watching. If you did watch, if you didn't, I hate you.
This has been Dark Lord Cthulhu.